Carinibacterium diphtheriae, or just C. diphtheriae, takes its name from the Greek carini, that means club, and diphtheriae, which means leather. So to sum this up, C. diphtheriae is a club-looking bacteria that causes diphtheria, an infection with a characteristic tough leathery membrane that forms in the pharynx. C. diphtheria has four main subspecies, C. diphtheriae mitis, C. diphtheriae intermedius, C. diphtheriae gravis, and C. diphtheriae belfonti. Alright, now C. diphtheriae has a thick peptidoglycan cell wall that takes in purple dye when gram-stained, so it's a gram-positive bacteria. It's aerobic, which means that it requires oxygen to grow, and it does not form spores. Now, when stained with Albert's stain, these bacteria demonstrate some unique features. They look like green, club-shaped bacteria with metachromatic granules, which are these dark blue dots made of phosphate, located at the bacterial poles. When there are a lot of them clustered together, these bacteria seem to be arranged in a characteristic pattern that resembles Chinese letters. Finally, C. diphtheria is a fastidious bacteria. This means that it can only grow on special nutrients-enriched media. The medium commonly used to grow this bug is cysteine tellurite blood auger, on which C. diphtheriae grow into black colonies. Alright, any of the C. diphtheriae subspecies can be either toxigenic or not, depending on whether or not they produce the diphtheria toxin, or DT for short. DT is a cytotoxic protein, where cytotoxic means it causes damage to host cells. In fact, all the C. diphtheriae subspecies start out as non-toxigenic, but they become toxigenic after they're infected by a beta bacteriophage. This is a kind of virus that attaches the bacteria and merges into its own genome with the bacterias. The beta bacteriophage genome contains tox genes, which codes for diphtheria toxin production. Following this, C. diphtheriae can make DT, and in turn, cause diphtheria. Now, DT has two main subunits, A and B, joined by the disulfide bond with each of the subunits playing a specific role in the invasion and destruction to the host cells. The B subunit, which is the bigger portion of DT complex, helps binding to the host cell membrane. After attaching to the host cells, the whole DT complex gets slowly engulfed by the cell membrane, which invaginates to form a sac on its inner side. The sac then separates from the actual cell membrane, forming a vesicle called an endosome. Within the host cell's cytoplasm, the medium inside the endosome becomes more acidic, and as a consequence, the disulfide bond holding the two subunits together becomes weak and eventually breaks, separating the subunits. The A subunit then diffuses through the endosome membrane into the cytoplasm, where it goes straight to the ribosomes. Here it interferes with cell protein synthesis. This happens because the A subunit has an ADP ribose group, which attaches to the elongation factor, EF2, an important ribosomal protein that joins amino acids together during protein synthesis. This process is called EF2 ADP ribosylation, and it results in complete deactivation of the EF2, which stops protein synthesis and leads to cell death. Alright, now C. diphtheriae mainly causes diphtheria in unvaccinated or immunocompromised people. Most often, the bacteria can be transmitted from one person to another mainly by respiratory droplets, following coughing or sneezing, in which case it causes pharyngeal diphtheria but they can also enter the body through open lesions on the skin, causing cutaneous diphtheria. Following inhalation of infected respiratory droplets, C. diphtheriae attaches to the pharyngeal epithelial cells, where they release DT toxin. This causes local inflammation that leads to necrosis of pharyngeal tissue, and neck swelling. The necrotic tissue builds up over the pharynx and larynx, forming a gray adherent leathery membrane, commonly referred to as a pseudomembrane. In some cases, a portion of the pseudomembrane can detach and get lodged into the trachea or bronchi, and when it's big enough, it can block the airways completely, causing death by asphyxiation. If left untreated, the bacteria gradually invades deeper into the pharyngeal wall, until it reaches the bloodstream, from where it can move to distant organs like the heart, causing myocarditis or inflammation of the heart muscle, or the kidneys, causing acute tubular necrosis, or destruction to the renal tubules. C. diphtheriae can also travel to the nerves, causing nerve demyelination, meaning they destroy the myelin sheath covering the nerve axons, which leads to polyneuropathy. Diphtheria polyneuropathy usually affects the oculomotor nerve, causing oculomotor palsy, meaning the muscles that move the eyes are impaired. It can also affect the phrenic nerve, 
which innervates the diaphragm, and in this case, it might cause trouble breathing. Regardless of the affected system, people with diphtheria infection present with symptoms of low-grade fever, general malaise, and weakness. In pharyngeal diphtheria, people present with sore throat, a swollen neck that people commonly call bull neck, and the pharyngeal pseudomembrane formation that usually can cause difficulty breathing associated with respiratory wheezes or stridor. In cutaneous diphtheria, there are typically chronic skin ulcers, which are shallow. With myocarditis, there might be signs of cardiac dysfunction, like arrhythmias or even heart failure, which is when the heart can't pump enough blood to meet the body's demands. With acute tubular necrosis, there might be oliguria, which is decreased urine production. With oculomotor palsy, there might be diplopia, which means double vision, or the person might not be able to move their eyes up, down, or to the side. Diagnosing diphtheria is mainly done by cultures of swabs from the pharynx or the suspected skin lesion to isolate C. diphtheriae. When the culture gets positive, next you want to figure out the C. diphtheriae strain in question is toxigenic. This is done by Elix test, in which C. diphtheriae is grown on an auger plate that's embedded with an anti-toxin impregnated filter paper. If the strain makes DT, the toxin reacts with the antitoxin, resulting in bands of visible precipitations. Another method consists of detecting the bacteria's toxigenicity in its DNA using polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. The treatment for diphtheria starts right upon clinical suspicion, even before diagnostic confirmation. It starts with isolating the patient to prevent further spread, and then penicillin G is given, or erythromycin in case of allergy. Then, if the infected bacteria is proven to be toxigenic with Elix test, diphtheria antitoxin is given to counter the effects of the bacterial toxin. Luckily, there's a vaccine to prevent diphtheria. This vaccine consists of a toxoid, which is a modified DT with the ability to activate the immune system and make it ready to tackle a real infection without causing damage to tissues. C. diphtheria toxoid is usually combined with other vaccines against Clostridium tetani, which causes tetanus, and Bordetella pertussis, which causes whooping cough and together they're called the DTAP vaccine, given to children between 2 months and 6 years of age. Alright, as a quick recap. Carinibacterium diphtheriae is a gram-positive, club-shaped bacteria that causes diphtheria infection. It's non-modal, aerobic, non-spore-forming, and it has metachromatic granules when stained with Albert stain. When infected by a beta bacteriophage, C. diphtheriae becomes toxigenic so it starts to produce diphtheria toxin, which causes tissue destruction and inflammation. Diphtheria can present as pharyngeal or cutaneous diphtheria. With pharyngeal diphtheria, a pseudomembrane forms over the pharynx and larynx, and it might detach and cause airway obstruction. Sometimes the bacteria can spread to other places, like the heart, resulting in diphtheria myocarditis, the kidneys resulting in acute tubular necrosis, or even the nerves resulting in diphtheria polyneuropathy. With cutaneous diphtheria, there are chronic shallow skin ulcers. The diagnosis depends on cultures, but treatment with penicillin G or erythromycin can be initiated upon clinical suspicion. Diphtheria antitoxin is also given for toxigenic strains, 